I I made it a policy Uh through these years on birthdays and Christmas time. I've made it a policy for these many years. I mean the 20, 37 years I've been in the pulpit, uh, the pastor and the pulpit. I've made it a policy always to look at every card that comes my way. Every child who makes a card in a a Sunday school class, I look at that card. I've done that for years. Uh, I'm starting this off because I'm going to talk about a couple of cards I received. Uh, I'm sort of heart sick inadvertently uh, through an unfortunate circumstance today. Some of the things that were sent to me got in the wrong box, and the box got in the garbage can. And we have been out to the garbage can and taken every piece of paper out there. And I'm going to go through every card again, be sure that everything was... i got sacks of garbage in my office. And, uh, but uh, inadvertently, uh, some things got in the wrong place. But that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that I read every card. <coughs> and I will have read every card. And uh, I, thought I thought I already had, but I will... But one card, uh, one or two of them are unusually funny. One one lady sent me a card on the staff. She and her husband said, uh, <coughs> so, she said I, I had a picture of somebody holding a little wand up here, and she said, this is a magic wand. She said, every time I hit anybody with this wand, it adds a year to their lives. And opened up on the inside, and she said, good night. I've been beating the fire out of you lately, haven't I? And uh, so uh, <coughs> I... I really are beating the tar, I think it said. And uh, so then there are also some very nice ones, too, besides that one. But uh, I, uh, I've always made the policy. In in the cards this year, there was one from our oldest daughter, Becky. Becky's 31. And she said something that reminded me of my sermon tonight. She said, she said uh, by the way, when, when Becky was a little girl, she a little girl, uh, two or three years old, <laughs> Her hair was as golden as the sun. I mean, it was just absolutely bright, yellow, gold. And uh, so the car, she wrote a note on the card, and she said, Dear Dad, she said, Somewhere in this 31-year-old body of mine, there is still a little golden-haired girl who loves her dad very much. And I thought about that as I thought about my message tonight of all of the peoples that God loved. He dearly loved the tribe of Ephraim. I'm not sure why God loved Ephraim so much, but God seemingly could not let Ephraim go. He said in one place, I think it's chapter 4 and verse 17, though don't hold, hold me to it, he said, Ephraim is joined to his idols, let him alone. But then over in chapter, I think it's chapter 11, Again, I'm not for dead sure, but I think that's it. Chapter, uh, yes, 11 of Hosea. God says to Ephraim, Ephraim, I, I said in chapter 4, you're joined to your idols. Let him alone. Ephraim is joined to his idols. Let him alone. But he said, Ephraim, I, uh, I taught you how to walk. I remember when I used to hold you with a hand and taught you how to walk. I remember the first word you said. He likens this, this uh, tribe, Ephraim, uh, to a child. And he says, Ephraim, I remember when you were a child. And I recall when I taught you how to walk. And I recall when you'd stumble and fall and I'd pick you up again. And Ephraim, God said, Ephraim, I can't let you go. I love you too much. And I cannot let you go. God had a special, special place in his heart for Ephraim. But God came to Ephraim in Hosea chapter uh, 7 and uh, verse 8. And he said, Ephraim, you're a cake not turned. He said, your big problem is you're a cake not turned. What does it mean? You ever fix a cook pancakes and you'd pour a pancake maybe and, uh, and cook it? <coughs> and then you'd forget and, and walk away and do something else. All of a sudden you smell something burning. And you realize that you'd burned one side, but the other side was still bubbling just as raw as it could be. And the dough was, was, was uncooked at all. And there was a, a pancake uh, <coughs> burned on one side. Uh, I, uh, if I eat eggs, I, I'm not a great egg eater. 
And but if I eat eggs, I usually uh, eat an omelet. And I always I, I like to I like to I like to like to look. I like to like to look at what I eat. I don't like to eat anything that's not pretty. And so um, <laughs> that's one reason why <clears throat> I never could eat brains and eggs. No way in the world. Just no way. I've tried all the ketchup. I've baptized the thing in ketchup over and over again. But uh, I was like the fellow that, that tried that said to his friends that. So I bet you I can eat a hundred raw oysters. The fellow said, bet you can't. Oh, he said, I can too. <laughs> hundred raw oysters. Oh, he said, I can't. Bet you can't. Okay, I said, you watch me. So he ate 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 91, 92, 90, 90, 90, 92, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, as always, that way about brains and eggs, uh, it just never did work. I like something that looks nice when I eat. And I always choose the best side, the prettiest side of the omelet, and have it facing me. Always do. That's why I can't, uh, <laughs> I can't eat eggs sunny side up. I want the sun to set before I eat them. No way. I, uh, <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> I mean, a <laughs> raw thing looking up at me. I can't even eat a fish. Uh, whole. I don't want that fish looking at me while I eat it. I, I, no way. I get a guilty conscience, and uh, uh, <laughs> I get thinking about mama fish and papa fish that are home, and little little baby fish won't be coming home ever again because he, he went into the ministry. But uh, I uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> have an awful hard time. So I am. Uh, when I eat when I eat an omelet, I always figure out which is the nicest side, the prettiest side, and turn it up. Now, <laughs> this uh, this description is used of Ephraim. God said, "Ephraim, you like a cake unturned. You're burned on one side, but you're raw <laughs> on on the other side." A lady is cooking, and uh, she makes pancakes. She doesn't mean to burn one side. She doesn't mean to forget to turn, but she gets busy and <laughs> and. Uh, and not intentionally, but she gets busy and forgets to turn the pancake, and it's burned on one side, and it's no good on that side because it's too brown, and it's, it's no good on the other side because it's not brown at all. And God said, now, Ephraim, that's your problem. He said, you're going to seed on one side and have done a thing about the other side. You're not well-rounded. You're not well-balanced. You're not uh, complete. You're not mature. you got to... So on, over here, you're doing this too much and not doing this enough, and then you'll do this too much and not do this enough. He said, Ephraim, you're a cake, not turn. <laughs> now, the word here is the word perfect. When uh, Jesus said, be you therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, he wasn't saying, be you therefore sinless, even as your Father in heaven is sinless. He's saying, be you therefore complete or mature. Now, for example, uh, in, in I have I ha he's talking about having all your faculties. Now I have a perfect body. Now hold it, don't throw anything at me. Uh, my body is nice. I uh, <laughs> I got a scar on the leg. I got a problem with my esophagus. I've got uh, I've got problem with uh, uh, not not enough on top of my skull and not enough underneath my skull. And uh, but uh, but I have a perfect body. You know why? Because I have two arms and and I got five fingers at the end of each one, and I got two legs and I got five toes at the end of each one, and I got two eyes and two ears and I've got uh, 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 one tongue. Some of you have more than that. I only have one. I have one tongue, and uh, I, I have uh, I, so I have all my faculties. Now some people have lost an eye. Now their body is not perfect. The word means complete. It means mature. It means every faculty in its place. It means uh, having all you're supposed to have. Some people have lost a finger. Now their bodies may be stronger than mine, and the truth is they may be more perfect as we count perfection than mine, but they're not perfect as God counts perfection because they're not complete. There's a, a, something missing, a member missing. <laughs> some, some people have a, an arm missing or a leg missing, um, or... Um, some folks uh, have a brain missing, and uh, but uh, uh, those aren't perfect. 
Now, uh, what Paul, what, John, what Jesus said, be you therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, he's saying, I want you to be complete. I want you to be mature. I want you to have all the Christian faculties. I don't want you to pray at the expense of soul winning, or read the Bible at the expense of prayer, or um, be um, <laughs> separated at the expense of serving God, or hate sin at the expense of loving God, or love God at the expense of hating sin. I want you to have every faculty that the Christian ought to have, be you therefore complete, be you therefore perfect, be you therefore mature, um, even um, as your Father in heaven is perfect or complete or mature. Now, I often find myself, for example, having a problem along this line when it comes to zeal and, uh, and knowledge. I've been through this in uh, other sermon, but uh, just a, a bit of uh, overlapping. I, uh, <laughs> Romans chapter 10 says, Brethren, my prayer to God and heart's desire this one is that they're not to say it. For I bear them record they have a zeal of, not, not of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, he said this. <laughs> he said uh, they, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. What does it mean? It means they were zealous, but they did not. Uh, the other side of the cake uh, was, not, was, not, was not to turn. The zeal side was burned, but the knowledge side was not had not been cooked at all. It was uh, uh, it was burnt on one side, and it was raw on the other side. Now, you know, I don't know about you, but I have a problem about this matter. I I, uh, I love zeal, but I also love knowledge. Now, I have a problem. When I get the zeal, I seem to lose the knowledge. When I get the knowledge, I seem to lose the zeal. I was up in Canada preaching several years ago, many years ago now. And, uh, in fact, so many years ago, I was a young man. And uh, I was in Ottawa, Canada. I was preaching uh, for five days and nights at a citywide meeting in Ottawa. On Friday, I had come to the close of the week, as almost the close, and an old Scottish preacher walked up with his Scottish uh, accent and said, uh, Dr. Hyam, I admire you very much. And I said, Thank you, sir. And he said, the thing I admire about you is your zeal. He said, you really have a lot of zeal for the Lord. Then he went on to say, when I was a young man, Dr. Hiles, I too had to choose between knowledge and zeal. And I said, you can have your sword back if you want it. I took the bloody sword out and gave it back to him. Now, the truth is, <laughs> most of us do have to choose between knowledge and zeal. I often say when I'm preaching to preachers, uh, for example, did you ever, uh, did you ever see a professor in a college that had any fire? Ever see any? I mean, they're dead as king cut. Not here, of course, but, uh, but, uh, <laughs> it's hard to find a professor that's on fire for God. And also, I say, did you ever see an evangelist that knows how to read and write? You see, on one side, you got the zeal. On one side, you got the fellow that passes out tracts and preaches on the street and goes so winning. <laughs> And he's the, uh, he's the fellow that goes on. But on the other side, you've got the knowledge. I know some people have the zeal, don't have the knowledge. I know some people have the knowledge, don't have the zeal. But God is, that's what God is saying to Ephraim. He's saying, you're a cake not turned. Uh, one side, <laughs> in one area, you're burnt. You, you, you've overdone it. In the other area, you haven't even been cooked yet. You're not even warmed yet. You're burnt on one side and you're, uh, you're raw on the other side. Let me ask you a question tonight. Are you excessive in your zeal at the expense of knowledge? God does not want that. God wants a proper balance of zeal and knowledge. That means that uh, maybe a young college student who's on fire for God and he's ready to charge hell with a squirt gun and, and he's ready to go for God and, uh, and uh, he's, uh, he's uh, <laughs> zealous. That's good. But now I want to tell you something. Don't you do that and not learn this book. Don't you be zealous at the expense of the Word of God. God intends for your zeal to be knowledgeable zeal. He intends for your fire to be facts on fire and not foolishness on fire. And so I say to you tonight, yeah. <laughs> God <laughs> says, you're a cake not turned. you got your zeal and you got the zeal burning and you're burnt on one side. Now, learn the Bible. Learn the Bible. Be sure you know the Word of God. Now, go to the other side. <laughs> I say this. It's a, it's a very, very tempting thing for people who love to study, especially people who have intellectualism, which, of which I have not been infected yet. 
Uh, I think that's obvious. But uh, uh, it's easy for some people just to want to study the deep things of God and just get in your study and say that, listen, many a church tonight across this country is languishing because the pastor is burnt on the study side and he's raw on the zeal side. And there are many churches tonight in this country who are, who are, who are, who are languishing in mediocrity and failure <laughs> because the pastor is burnt on the zeal side and he is raw on the knowledge side. Now, I want our folks here to be well-rounded. I say to our people, our young people especially, I want you to know how to behave in any proper given situation. I, I believe that's what education is. I think education is knowing how to behave in, in any given situation without being an embarrassment to those who love you and to those who know you. I think that the right, right kind of a Christian ought to know how to behave himself at a tea, a tea party, or a tea. I think that that same person ought to know how to behave himself uh, fishing on a Mississippi River. Though I think if you got any sense, you'd rather fish than go to a tea. But I, uh, <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want a bunch of zealous nuts running around this church, nor a bunch of of, of learned uh, uh, deadheads either. I want to ask you a question tonight: Are you burnt on one side and raw on the other? Are you uh, are you in love with the book <laughs> and yet not in love with spreading the book? Are you in love with the message, but not in love with propagating the message? Are you in love with the truth without, without uh, spreading the truth and carrying the truth? Is that you? Then tonight, I say to you, turn the pancake over. Turn the cake on the other side and add zeal to your knowledge. But <laughs> if you're the kind who <laughs> go soul winning 20 hours a week, read your Bible 20 minutes a week, then you, you've got a problem too. And so I come to you and say, as God said to Ephraim, you're a cake not turned. You're burnt on one side. You're burnt on the zeal side and raw on the knowledge side. Or you're burnt on the knowledge side and raw on the zeal side. And God comes and says, learn the book, learn the book, stay in the book, stay in the book. And then when you stay in the book, he said, stay after sinners and take what you know and spread what you know and carry the truth of God that you learn in the book. Well, years ago, when I came to this church, I, I guess if I told you the, the most the most wonderful letter I ever received, I'd have a hard time not including this for consideration. It may have been the great one of the greatest, if not the greatest, compliment I've had since I've been here, and it wasn't all true. After I'd been here a year or so, <laughs> I, uh, I got a letter from a lady, and she said, Dear Pastor, she said for a year this church was without a pastor. Our pastor, Dr. Owen Miller, left, and for a year we had no pastor. And she said I'd pray one night for God to give us a pastor that had a heart for souls, an evangelistic type. Then she said the next night I'd say, no, 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 I, I just don't want that. Uh, she said, uh, I'm afraid if we get that, we won't get any Bible teaching. And she said, so I'd pray, Lord, send us a man who's a Bible teacher type. Then she'd say, no, 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 no. The next night I'd pray, Lord, send us a man that has the fire of God in his soul and loves sinners. And then she said, no, 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 <laughs> and, but, uh, anyway, well, that ruined that one, didn't it? I had you, I had you about to cry there for a minute, and you started laughing, and I started crying, but, um, but it was. Now, now, that, that letter is what I want to be. I don't want to be some kind of a, of a, of a nutty zealot, not know the Bible. <laughs> I don't want to be some kind of a dead theologian that doesn't care if the world goes to hell. I mean, it doesn't matter how much Bible you know if you don't use it. It doesn't matter. Listen. Remember that story over in, uh, in the book of, um, in the story of, of David, when David's son Absalom had rebelled against his dad, and David, rather than fight against his son Absalom, he fled out to a place called Maonaim, and there, the darkest hour of David's life, and David knew some mighty dark hours. David looked back and saw the dust of battle rising, realizing that his own son was in battle against his own army at the time. And uh, David's heart was broken. His own son was trying to, to take his father's throne. And um, all of a sudden, the, the dust of battle subsided. And David said, I wonder, I wonder how it is with my boy Absalom. 
And so out came a messenger whose name was Ahimeaz. Ahimeaz was fast. He was the fastest runner of all. He came huffing and puffing and he ran out. And David said, is, is the young man safe? Is my boy okay? Oh, that's interesting to me. David didn't ask whether or not he'd won the battle. He wanted to know how his boy was. Though his boy was his enemy, he wanted to know how his boy was. Though his boy was trying to take over his father's throne, David, David wanted to know how his boy was. He said, is the young man safe? And him he asked. I can see him safe. Don't you want to know uh, who won the battle? And David said, not yet. Is the young man safe? He said, don't you want to know if the palace is still standing? And David said, not yet. Is the young man safe? <laughs> My boy, okay. And uh, finally David said, okay, him he asked, what's the message? He said, what message? He said, what's the message? You have. You're a messenger. What's the message? Him he asked, said, did you notice? I beat Cushai I, out here. I ran the, out here and got her before he did. Uh, okay, okay, that's good. What's the message? <laughs> and him he asked, said, but your highness, you haven't said a word about how fast I run. And David said, boy, you on how fast you run. What's the message? He said, I don't know what the message is. And I'm talking to folks tonight in this room that are busy running. But you don't know what the message is yet. I mean, you haven't, you haven't got yourself grounded yet. <laughs> you don't live in the book. And then the little prodding Cushai came out. Cushai was not as spectacular as a Hemias. Cushai was not as fast as a Hemias. But Cushai ran as fast as he could. And David said, is the young man saved? And I can hear Cushai say, don't you want to know who won the battle? And David says, is the young man saved? And, and he said, don't you want to know if the palace is still standing? And David said, is the young man saved? How's my boy? And though the message was a negative and a bad one, he did carry the message. Now listen to me, folks. I want us to have here a great church of soul winners and bus workers. And I want us in this fall program to go, go for God and get the job done for God. But I'm not willing to rear, just raise up here a church a full of bunch of ignorant nuts. I want to raise up a church of people that live in this book. I want to grow up a church of people here that walk with God in prayer. And once you walk with God in prayer, and once God's power comes upon you, and once you have the message of God, then you run as fast as you can as long as you keep the message. Of your cake unturned. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I also have the same problem, and I'm sure you do too, about disposition. I read in John chapter 1, verse 14, and what I think is probably the most important verse in the Bible, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, this, uh, <laughs> this uh, was a, a one line, one sentence biography of our Lord's life on earth. And the Word became flesh. That's the virgin birth. That's Jesus, God incarnate through His Son, Jesus Christ. And dwelt, our tabernacle among us, and we beheld His glory. <laughs> the glory as of the only begotten, the Father, full of grace and truth. I oftentimes say this. It's hard to have grace and truth. Now it is. It's awfully hard. It's hard to stand for the truth and say, I believe it. I'll live by it. I'll die by it. Nobody will change my mind. It's hard to be gracious and have that kind of personality and have that kind of stand. But God wants us to. God wants us to be full of grace, love, mercy, compassion, forgiveness, kindness, forbearance, long-suffering. <laughs> God wants us. <laughs> At the same time, God wants us to say, that Bible is the Word of God. Like it or lump it, I believe that Bible is the Word of God. Jesus Christ is God's virgin-born Son. I'll live by it. I'll die by it. I'll not dip my sails to wrong. Right is wrong. Black, uh, wrong is, right is right. Wrong is wrong. White is white. Black is black. And I'm not going to dip my sails. I'm not going to yield my conviction. And yet at the same time, God wants in that same person a <laughs> love and a grace. I'm talking to folks tonight. Your cake's unturned. <laughs> yeah. you, have, uh, you have grace, but you're compromising. Sweetness, kindness, that's good. But it's no good unless you stand for it's right. So I'm talking to folks tonight. <laughs> your cake's unturned. You're burnt on one side and you're raw on the other side. You got conviction. You got courage. I don't care what you like. You're here taking back scratching, penny pitching. Dick a lipping soft, soap and pink, tin and pussy footers. I'm gonna stand, and I'm gonna stand, and I'm gonna stand. And then you're as cantankerous as a booger man is. You're a cake unturned. You're a burn on one side, and you're all on the other. 
Now, I have that problem. I've often sit across the country in a sermon I have. <laughs> little like this. <laughs> now, I have a hard time. When I get the grace I ought to have, I lose the truth. I get the truth I ought to have, I lose the grace. I, it's like a seesaw. I get the grace and, and the truth comes down. I get the truth and the grace comes down. And, uh, uh, for example, sometimes I'll say to myself, Now, Jack, <laughs> you're, uh, you're, you're not preaching hard enough. You, you're preaching, you're crying and weeping and you have compassion and grace, <laughs> but, but you've got to stand. And boy, I get on my knees and I'm going to stand. And I get as mean as the devil. I want to push, push old men down steep hills in wheelchairs and, and trip old ladies while they walk across busy downtown streets and stick little boys and girls in the eyeballs with ice picks. I get as mean as the devil. And so I get myself down and say, Jack, you got the truth now. You better work on the grace. You get mean. Some of you folks have noticed that from time to time. And <laughs> mean. And <laughs> so, uh, I work on the grace and then I get loving and sweet. And then I want to join the National Council of the Churches. Now, what does God want us to be? God wants us to have zeal, but God wants the other side of the cake turned too, and God wants us to have knowledge. God wants us to have truth, but God wants the other side of the cake turned too, and God wants us to have grace. God comes along and says, uh, Ephraim, you're, you're, you're tilted. You're, uh, you're, you're, uh, uh, hobby horse riding. You're, uh, you're on one rail and one track. And he said, yeah, you're a cake unturned. You, you, uh, in some areas, you're, you cook so long you burn. And on the other side, uh, you're, you're, you're raw. And then you get over here and you work on the raw side and you get it all cooking and get it burned and the other side gets raw. And I say tonight, I'm talking to folks in this room who have a lot of conviction, but you have, you've been mean as the devil. And I want to say this to you. I'm not concerned about a fundamentalism that's intolerant. I'm not concerned about a fundamentalism that's unkind or ungracious. I'm not concerned about a fundamentalism that gets mad and, and fumes and fights and calls names and writes up people in, in tabloids. I'm not concerned about that. Listen, there's not a preacher in this country who has any more convictions than I do or more, if you pardon the expression, idiosyncrasies in some cases than I do about right and wrong. But I will not. I will not. Stoop the lowest to slander people and, uh, and enter into this thing of trying to, <laughs> to, to wreck people's character and become a character assassin. I won't do that. Why? I want to have the truth. But God knows I want to have the grace. And I want to have the grace. And God knows I want to have the truth. And I want to have the zeal. And God knows I want to have the knowledge. And I want to have the knowledge. But God knows I want to have the zeal. I'm talking to somebody tonight who needs to get turn the cake over. Your convictions are good, and I'm glad they are. <laughs> but you're getting cantankerous, hard to get along with, and critical of people that are not just like you on every issue, and, uh, and ca- name calling, and hatred, and slander. Now turn the cake over, and let's get love, and let's get mercy, and let's get compassion, and let's get forbearance, and let's get long suffering, and let's get, uh, <laughs> get uh, patience, and let's get kindness, and let's get brotherly affection, and let's turn the cake over. I'm saying if you got the zeal, but you don't live in the book, turn the cake over. You got the book, but you're not winning souls and on fire for God, turn the cake over. If you're, if you're, you have conviction and standards and, and believe in right and wrong, but, but no kindness and long suffering and patience and love, turn the cake over. Or if you're loving and gooey and sweet and kind, but no conviction, turn the cake over. Your cake unturned, burned on one side. By the way, I also have the same problem sometimes concerning love and hate. My Bible says <laughs> that he that, uh, he that uh, loveth God hateth evil. But his son used to say, you can't love flowers unless you hate weeds. And you can't love health unless you hate germs. And you can't love God unless you hate sin. But you know it's awfully easy for that hatred for sin to get burned? <laughs> There's a fella in this room tonight. I feel sure he's here. He goes to church here. He used to go to church in California. <laughs> and Dr. Ray Batum was his pastor. And Dr. Batum got up one night in a sermon and he tore loose on this thing of adult bookstores. And he, boy, he just leveled them, the adult bookstores, and tore them to pieces. And he got this guy so stirred up. I think he's here tonight. He's always here. He got this guy so stirred up. He went out as soon as the service was over and stuck a match and 
set an adult bookstore on fire and burn that thing to the ground. And <laughs> yeah, there you go. Amen. Amen. <laughs> You're burnt on one side. That, that bookstore's burnt on one side, too. And we're <laughs> all on the other. But anyway, um, you catch it, did you? <laughs> but um, <laughs> saying that, <laughs> I'm not talking about that. Dr. John Ryan preached a sermon of, of, and wrote a book on what's wrong with the movies. A fella in Ohio got a hold of that sermon on what's wrong with the movies <laughs> and pulled the Carry Nations Act. He got a hand axe and I think it was Cincinnati or in Ohio <laughs> and went down to the local movie house and went up to the room upstairs where they had the projector in the movie. And while the movie was going on, he took a hand axe and chopped that projector to pieces. And, uh, of course, <laughs> took care of that movie <laughs> that night and got two years in the penitentiary because he did it. And uh, now, if you're going to chop something up, that's a mighty good thing to chop up. But uh, old Dr. Bob Jones used to say, I knew a fella cussed all the time, but never cussed anybody, didn't need a cussing. And uh, now, <laughs> I'm not suggesting, look, I want you to hate the adult bookstores, but let's stop short, please, of burning them, burning them to the ground. Just, 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 just send him a little bit. But uh, no, don't you do that. I'll be uh, the police will have me in the jail before morning for inciting you to burn them. <laughs> I want you to hate sin, but I want you to love sinners. I want you to hate liquor, but I want you to love the liquor drinker. I want you to hate alcoholism, but I want you to love the alcoholic. I want you to hate immorality, but I want you to love the fallen person. I want you to hate uh, drink, uh, drinking and cussing and smoking. But I want you to love the people that do it. God never teaches us to be unkind to sinners. Oh, they said of Jesus, they said he eats with sinners. He eats with sinners. No, he didn't participate, but he ate with them. He loved them. But it's so easy for us, especially in a church like this, I hate to bring this up, but I think we all sort of want to. I'm about to get the truth here. I'll get back to the grace here in a few minutes. I'll get it balanced out. I'll, I'll turn it over. <laughs> you know, it's so easy to say, boy, I'll tell you what. These guys that wear these pink shirts. Huh? Boy, these guys that wear <laughs> lavender shirts. Now, the truth is, if you don't think it's okay to wear, you should wear a pink shirt or a lavender shirt, then don't wear one. But if I want to wear one, you leave me alone. <laughs> now, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, you'd be amazed the letters I get. <clears throat> I'll tell you, <clears throat> I'm not going to stay in this church, boy, as long as you have Halloween. Well, I don't, I don't personally have Halloween myself. I don't. But, uh, <laughs> and if you don't believe in Halloween, that's okay with me. It doesn't bother me at all. But you know, uh, that's not going to make you Elijah because you stand about Halloween. You know. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't go to the fire furnace because they didn't decorate a Christmas tree. Now, you may not like Christmas tree. That's okay with me. I don't care. <laughs> but, but but it's not going to make you in Fox's Book of Martyrs. It may make you in Iliad's Book of Idiots, but it's not. Well, I mean, <laughs> God said, <laughs> he said, look. <laughs> By the way, a church like this, you've got to watch it all the time. Look, folks, we're here from all over America. We've got more people here, got more strange convictions. I got a letter last week. You've seen these ladies that, that uh, <laughs> blouses. <laughs> have a little pie on it about like yours there. It's a miniature thing like this. We've got folks here crusading against those things. I mean, boy, I'll tell you what. I'm not going to have anything to do with anybody. Let's let these ladies wear these little ties. You know, you're going to go down religious history as being one of the great defenders of the faith. I mean, Martin Luther started the Reformation over that. You know that, don't you? That's one of those theses he's nailed on the wall. Yeah. But if it's scriptural, why are you saying, blessed be the... I shouldn't say that. I told you I wasn't going to be funny tonight. <laughs> I didn't tell you I wasn't going to try. 
But you know, in a great crowd like this, boy, Eric, for example, <laughs> I want some. I won't eat out on Sunday. No way. I haven't eaten out on Sunday since 1949. <laughs> no way I'll do it. <laughs> won't do it. You know why? Because i got conviction. I don't want to call those folks to work at a restaurant on Sunday. Of course, I don't mind stopping by White Ham Pantry getting a paper on Sunday morning. See, the Bible says it's wrong for folks to work in restaurants on Sunday morning, but okay for them to work in White Ham Pantry. It's right there in the book. Yeah. <laughs> I'm saying, I've got my idiosyncrasies too. I sang the Bible the other night down in Texas. And the lady said, how are you? I said, how are you tonight? She said, fine, how are you? I said, ornery. She said, the whole world knows that. God comes along and says, Ephraim, listen, listen. How? How did Ephraim get away from God? How did Ephraim do that? I'll tell you how Ephraim got away from God. Ephraim neglected some of the Christian virtues at the expense of being extravagant in the other Christian virtues. Same thing's true about prayer and work. It's so easy for us to... to you know, I, I believe, I honestly believe that it wouldn't be any real problem for me just to really pray 12, 14 hours a day and just stop with everything else. But that's not pleasing to God. That's a cake unturned. For you just to pray and that's all, God never calls anybody <laughs> unless they're <laughs> shut in or something God never calls anybody <laughs> just to pray. I mean, God says, I want you to pray. And, I, and by the way, I could, I could work all the time at the expense of prayer. The truth is, I'm the kind of guy that, that that I get so excited about most everything I do. Well, I could become a fanatic about any one thing I do at the expense of everything else I do. So I'm talking to folks tonight who haven't prayed ten minutes this week. You know it's the truth. Now, you work for God. <laughs> you are uh, <laughs> soul winning. <laughs> have a bus route. Call a Christian school. Have a Sunday school class. Boy, you're zealous. You're fundamentalist. You wrote letters about the uh, uh, getting us to pray on the moon and putting the Bible on the moon. Nobody up there to read it, but wanted up there. Boy, and you fought, you fought. You listen to all these radio preachers, and every time one comes on, they're going to get mud off television. And <laughs> next one comes on, we'll get prayer back in the public. You write me, and we'll get prayer back in the public school. What if you do? Who's going to pray, honey? I don't know about it. knows how to pray. I'm interested in getting prayer back in your life, in your home, in church. Prayer closet. <laughs> but I'm saying that it's so easy, so easy for us to to to, to, to have the cake of, of prayer. I could do it. I, and I'm talking to folks tonight. You haven't prayed ten minutes all week. You don't pray five minutes a day. I mean, you're raw on the prayer side, and you're burnt on the zeal side, and you're burnt on the work side, and raw on the on the devotion side, and you work, you're burnt on the on the on the working side, and you're raw on the meditation side. You don't walk with God. You don't know God. You're a burnt on one side. A fundamentalist, Scorpio Bible. Don't drink. Don't dip. Don't smoke. Don't chew. But the truth is, on the side of prayer. Bible study and devotion and meditation, you are as raw as a pancake that's not yet been turned over. Same thing concerning Bible and service. I was talking yesterday to Dr. Evans. And he was talking about the Lord's work. And I said, Doc, I could, I'd love to, I'd love in my own flesh to have time to study the sermons like I want to. If I had 15 hours of sermon a week, boy, I love, verse says, I love words. I dearly love <laughs> words and phrases and uh, figures of speech. I love them. If I had 15 hours of ser- uh, per sermon a week to study on my sermon, I, I, I'd, I'd work at being the next R.G. Lee. I don't think I could, but I'd work at it. But I know if I do that, there won't be any Hammond Baptist High School, or grade school, or junior high, <coughs> or Howells <coughs> Anderson College. I know them. If I do that, the work, the other work will flourish. So what do I do? I purposely do not preach as well as, uh, do not study <coughs> as much as I'd like to, because if I did, I'd be burned on the study side and raw on the organizing side, and raw <coughs> on, on the soul winning side. I'd like to, and I, I say this not boasting, 
But I do believe I could be a Bible teacher if I worked at it. God in some way has, has opened the Bible to me in, uh, in some areas. And if you'll read my books on, on, on prayer and Holy Spirit and uh, a book coming out on separation, uh, if you'll sit in the church here for a week, week after week and listen, uh, you'll know I love the Bible and I study the Bible. And I could very easily become a deeper lifer. I'd love to take the tabernacle and tell you everything that everything stands for in that tabernacle while the world perishes and goes to hell. It'd be easy for me, but I mustn't do it. So what do I do? I realize that in no area of my life am I what, what I could be if that were the only area of my life. So, <laughs> I'll take a B in my preaching instead of an A+. plus. So I can take time to win souls to Christ and organize soul winning. I could write better books than I write <laughs> if I had time <laughs> to research like I, w- I want to and would like to but if I took that time, I wouldn't have time for the sermon preparation. So what do I do? I just do a lot of things and make a B on all of them, maybe, rather than taking one thing and burning at Listen, I'm interested in the average grade, not the grade in one course. You, you teachers know <laughs> there are people who love a certain subject. They'll make an A in one subject and flunk everything else. That's not what God wants you to do. God's concerned about your average. God's concerned about your maturity. God's concerned about your your, your uh, uh, being perfect or mature, uh, well-rounded. That's what God wants. God doesn't want a bunch of zealous nuts. God wants a man to... I, uh, I want, and I mean this, I want to conduct the most comforting funeral that I can. And then when time comes for the wedding, I want to conduct the sweetest and most beautiful wedding possible to conduct. And then time comes to, <laughs> to uh, <laughs> preach a hellfire and brimstone sermon, I want to hang you over hell till your hair gets singed. I had a preacher friend down in East Texas, preached on hell on Sunday night, and one, a lost man was there, and a <laughs> lost man <laughs> died in an airplane crash the next week. And that preacher preached the same sermon on hell at the funeral he did that on Sunday night and told the people that the guy didn't get saved and went to hell. He said, that's all I can say. He went to hell. I wish he'd have gotten saved. And by the family was enraged, of course, and justifiably so. And they went and said, you can't go to the, <laughs> to the grave unless we dig one for you too. And <laughs> no way. <laughs> now what am I saying? <laughs> I'm saying that the preacher, look, you don't have to say the fellow went to hell. It doesn't do any good. Maybe he did. But I'm saying that, that God is saying, he, he said, look, I want you to be mature. But I, I know I know preachers that have no, uh, pro, uh, no propriety whatsoever. I want to be able to know how to talk about the Bible. I want to be able to know how to behave myself in any, any given place. When I first came to this church, we had a church softball team. We may still do. I don't know. We hadn't won a game since 1938, I think it was. But we had a church softball team. <laughs> and so, I used to pitch softball. So I didn't play at all, but I went to the game. And the pastor of the other church was there. Back in the days when the church was smaller, and I could do things like that more. And uh, and he had on, just what I have on, black coat, black tie, black shoes, black socks. He had a hearse. He'd been all ready to go. Somebody said this morning, this is your 57th birthday, isn't it? I said, huh, I'm wearing black, ain't I? The lady said to her husband, said, you forgot our anniversary. He said, no, I'm wearing a black tie. And uh, <clears throat> I told you it wouldn't be funny tonight. But <laughs> but I am. <laughs> this, this preacher came to the ball game, like I'm dressed here, just like that. And so his members... Uh, uh, were there watching? They, they saw him. He came out on the field, and 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 somebody said, "Hey, you you two reverends, won't you play some catch?" Well, I had on a pair of yellow slacks and a white short sleeve shirt, and uh, so I, I took the ball and I threw it to him, and he caught it like that. Then he threw it back like that, and his church members bowed their heads and shook him like that. You know why? <coughs> Fellow was. 
burnt on one side and raw on the other side. I want you to be a good Christian, a good preacher, but I want you to be a man. Well-rounded. I want you to be a man, but I want you to be a gentleman. Boy, I love what the Quaker said. He said, I would not hurt thee. I would do thee no ill. I would not so much as lift up my hand, dear beloved, to harm thee, but you are sitting where I'm about to shoot. I love that. Listen, be nice to a fellow when you kill him. And I want the people of this church to be the kind of people that know the book. Know the book. That isn't all. I want you to walk with God. But that isn't all. I want you to know how to pray. <laughs> that isn't all. <laughs> I want you to go soul winning. That isn't all. I want you to be courteous and kind. But that isn't all. I want you to be honest and pay your debts. That isn't all. I want you to have the goodness of God and, and, and compassion. And I want you to have every one of the faculties of Christian grace. Not at the expense of another. A kick unturned. You know, concerning the inside and outside, our Lord mentions. He said, some of you are like uh, whited sepulchers. He said, on the outside you're painted white. Inside you're like dead men's bones. He said, you're like a platter, a dirty platter. <laughs> he said, the outside of the platter is clean, but the inside is dirty. He said, you're like a cup. But the outside is shined and real nice but the inside is filthy. Now, I'm concerned about us having not just the outside burned. I want us to turn the cake over and get the inside right, too. And God says to, to Ephraim, He says, You're a cake unturned. I know some preachers who've gone to seed on prophecy. It's all they ever preach on is prophecy. Prophecy. Who's Antichrist? Where is he from? When? Where? How? What? Why? And, uh, <laughs> and yet, uh, that, that other things go raw while they get burned, while they burn their people on one subject. I know <coughs> preachers that, that, that have been burnt, that burned themselves on communism. I hate communism with all my heart. But you're not going to win over communism just by exposing communism. You have to get out and get the gospel out and get the message of grace. And the communism's on one side and the gospel of Christ is on the other side. You get a person born again. It takes care of the communism. It takes care of that. And I know people that say, ah, fight it and fight it and fight it. No soul winning. No love. No Bible study. No prayer line. Burned on one side, raw on the other. I know preachers and Christian people that are that way about politics. And I want good men in office. <laughs> and I'll guarantee you one thing. I'm not going to get off my throne, which is my pulpit, and spend my life trying to get good men in office. That's not my business. not my calling. God didn't call you to be a politician. doesn't say a word about it on your ordination paper. I think you ought to be, uh, be uh, interested in getting good men elected. But I'm saying, I know people that politics, 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 and they're cake unturned. I know a man that came and confessed to me, a famous preacher. You don't, you, you, you guess who he is, you won't guess it. He said, I got concerned in my local political situation. He said, I'd go to my, my church on Sunday morning at 8.30 and go through my old files and my old sermons and just grab one and walk in and preach it on Sunday. Burned on one side, raw on the other. I know preachers have gotten some wrapped up in the school business. They're no longer soul winners. They're no longer Bible students. They're no longer great prayer warriors. They're no longer pulpiteers. The church is second. The school is first. I'll say it, I'll say it before. I'll say it again. I wouldn't trade you one good fundamental church for 500 Christian schools. I mean that. I'm for the Christian school movement. And I wouldn't want my kids to go to public school for them not to read and write and go to a public school. And I mean that too. But I want you to serve notice on you, brother. I'll guarantee you a good old red hot soul winning Christ honoring sin hating uh, a Bible preaching church is more important than the 500 Christian schools. But we our Christian schools have become somewhat of a panacea for us. It's uh, <laughs> utopia. <laughs> we now have Christian schools and all across this country churches are dying because preachers are burned on one side and raw on the other side. I could go to the college and go wild. I could go out there and spend all my time out there. <laughs> I could go to Hammond Baptist High School. I'd love to. I'd love to go to Hammond Baptist High School. <laughs> I'd love to spend all my time out there, those kids. I'd love it. I'd love it. But I must not do that. I must turn the cake. I must try to be 
all the things that God wants me. I could get, I could go wild about writing books. I really could. I could just, I write books on the side. I write them driving down the street. I dictate books driving down the highway. <laughs> and I, and on the airplane sometimes, and sometimes in motel rooms. But my, that's not my big heart throb. My big heart throb is being a preacher and a pastor of a New Testament church. That's my big heart throb. But I do want to know all these other things. And so, God looked down and called Ephraim and said, I love you, Ephraim. I almost let you go and turn my back on you, but I couldn't do that because I remember when you were a baby, I taught you how to walk. I recall the first step you took and the first word you made, I said. And I remember how you used to hold my hand when you were a little child. I can't let you go, Ephraim. Now, I said, Ephraim, you've gone into sin, but here's what caused it. Your cake unturned. You've got one side over here <laughs> that's too much, too done, too well done. The other side over here that's raw. I said, Ephraim, turn it over now. Turn it over. In closing, may I say, there are people in this room tonight, and you know it's true. You love this book. And by the way, this is so easy, especially for college professors and college leaders to do it, and Christian school teachers. It's so easy for you to get the knowledge and lose the zeal. Now, let's turn the cake over now. Let's turn the cake over. Uh, you're just as much bound to go soul winning as the students are. And you're supposed to be just as zealous about getting sinners out of hell as the students are. And God expects you to be just as, <coughs> as much after the souls of men as the students are. God doesn't intend to build a cottage here. The students go soul winning and the professors study. No. Mm-mm. No. So, professor, turn the cake over now and get the zeal to your knowledge. Student, you turn the cake over and add the knowledge to your zeal. Bigot, turn the cake over and add grace to your truth. Compromiser, turn the cake over and add truth to your grace.